video was great. Not only is that a great reminder, but I think earlier, too, I, I had a vision that we were all going to be dancing this morning, you know, and I thought, they're never ready, so they're probably not going to dance. And if they're like me, they're kind of like, really? You're going to make us be joyful? Um, you know, whatever, Tony. And don't tell me what to do. I don't like when people tell me what to do either. But, but here's, here's what I know is this. There is no greater joy than the joy of God's salvation. There is, there is no greater joy than the joy of God's salvation. So, I'm sitting with a group of doctoral students, and I can't believe I'm going to do this. So, uh, you guys, you need to laugh with me here when it's really absurd that your pastor is about to do this. But, I'm sitting with doctoral students at Asbury, uh, about two summers ago. And we had chapel in the morning, and so we were in chapel, and we were doing a couple songs, and we got to, I think it was about the third song, I think, and so uh, the lady who was leading us started to, to play, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength, all right? And so, kind of childhood song, the joy of the Lord is my strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength, and so we're singing this, and I thought, really? Really? We're singing the joy of the Lord is my strength right now. 50 doctoral students, and we're thinking, of all the worship songs we picked, this is what we're singing. Okay, so we got done with that line, but it didn't stop there. So we did it one more time. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And then we got to verse 2, and the verse 2 is, ha, 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 ha. It reminded me of doo 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 doo. Uh, so, <laughs> anytime you sing songs about doo doo and ha ha, it's got to be a good day, all right? Um, yes. And so here, I, here I am with uh, you know fifty other doctor students, and I'm I'm watching this happen, and I'm sitting in the back, and I'm thinking, really, this is what we're doing right now. And what was funny about it, and what was great all at the same time, was everyone was smiling. And it was almost the ridiculousness and perhaps the childlikeness of faith that was captured even in that moment that reminded me of, I have every reason to be joyful. Even at 7.30 in the morning in the chapel before class. Because there is no greater joy than the joy of God's salvation. And in that moment, I was reminded with these other students too, it looks a little ridiculous sometimes when you sing and you dance and you're so overcome by the joy of the Lord. But there is no greater joy. These two verses, I want you to see these two verses again. I'm going to read these two verses. Psalm 30. Here's David, the Psalm of David. He says this. For his anger, the Lord, for the Lord's anger lasts only a moment. But his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night. But guess what comes in the morning? Rejoicing. Joy comes in the morning. And then you skip down to verse 11. He says that here's David. Oh God, you turned my wailing, my crying, my weeping, my mourning, you turned it into dancing. Think prom. No, don't think prom. That's not the dance I found. Yeah, never mind. Just think dancing at a, at a wedding. Think dancing at a wedding. You turned my wailing into dancing, you removed my sackcloth, the clothing of mourning, the clothing of repentance, and you clothed me with joy. That my heart may sing to you and not be silent. Oh Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. If there's any verse in scripture too, if there's any psalmist, David writes a lot of these psalms. If anyone knows what it's like for the Lord to be angry with him, and it lasts only a moment, but rejoicing lasts for a lifetime, King David knows. King David knows. He knows what it's like to have joy and lose it. He knows what that's like. He knows what it's like to be so broken that he prays a prayer. Oh God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. If you know David's story, you know it all went wrong. David was an awesome guy, pretty much a cool guy. Yes, he was a great king. He was one of the greatest kings of Israel, perhaps the greatest. He goes down in history knowing, being known as a man after God's own heart. And yet what you know, too, is David's story wasn't just this perfect, impeccable story. There was quite a bit of a hiccup in his story. Quite a bit of a hiccup, quite a bit of a story of brokenness and a plunge down into the depths and the pit of sin. And if you don't know David's story, if you're a little unfamiliar with it, let me just, I want to give you a recap of David's story. Things are going great with David. He's winning battles left and right. He is the king. Things are going great with Israel. King David stays at home for whatever reason. He's supposed to be out on the battlefield. 
Kings are supposed to be out with their men. But David stayed home for some reason this campaign. And he stayed at home. He went to bed that night. He slept. Something woke him up. He woke up in the middle of the night and he took a stroll out onto the roof of his palace. And David, while he's out on the roof of the palace, he sees something from the corner of his eye and it is a woman taking a bath. A beautiful woman. And David in that moment has a decision to make and here's what his decision is. I want to find out about this woman. Who is she? Well, they find out, he finds out, well, that's, that's Uriah's wife. Bathsheba is the wife of Uriah. And David said, go get her. Bring her to me. And so he has some of his men go get Bathsheba. Brings Bathsheba back to the palace. They sleep together. Guess what happens? Bathsheba becomes pregnant. And now David, in the midst of one decision, a broken decision, where his eyes were full of adultery, as Scripture will tell us. He acted in that moment. Not only did he see her, he decided to carry through and did the full act of adultery. This happens. She gets pregnant. Now David is in a dilemma. What am I going to do? She's pregnant. And so here's David's downward spiral. It's already begun, and it just goes deeper. So what does David do next? David thinks, I will get Uriah to come back home and sleep with her so that everyone will think it's his baby. It's a, what a great plan, right? So David gets Uriah. He says, Uriah, come on home. He brings Uriah home and says, Uriah, I want you to spend some time with your wife. Come home, enjoy a nice meal, get a good night's rest, a few nights rest. And Uriah, too holy, too righteous, he says, how can I go in and be with my wife when all the other men are still in the battlefield? And so he sleeps outside and says, I won't go in. As long as I live, I will not go in and sleep with my wife when the other men, they have to be out on the battlefield. And so then David says, bummer, that didn't work. So he has another plan. He says, I'll get him drunk. And then maybe if he's drunk, then he'll sleep with her because... When you're drunk, you obviously don't have all the capacities functioning very well. So he does the plan, he falls through with it, he invites Uriah over and says, Hey, enjoy a great meal with me. And he keeps giving him more wine, and more wine, and more wine. And he is so drunk, he's completely drink, drunk. But guess what? He still sleeps outside. He won't go in. He won't go inside. And then David thinks, I still got a dilemma on my hands. Now what am I going to do? And so here's David's next plan. This is what I want. Remember, this is a man after God's own heart. What does David do now? Okay, let me do this. Uriah, hey, I'm going to send a letter to the commander. He even sends it with Uriah. Uriah, take this to the commander and give him this message. And the message says, hey, I want you to do this. Put Uriah on the front lines of the battle and then withdraw the rest of the troops where the battle is fiercest so that he will die. A man after God's own heart. And so what happens? He reads the letter. He does exactly that. They go to the fiercest part of the battle. And there's Uriah. Uriah gets struck down. The message comes back to David. David is relieved. I've gotten rid of at least that problem. Now what's the next step that David needs to do? You know what David does? David's like, well, now I can marry Bathsheba. I'll just take her as one of my other wives. And here's, what's, here's what this is this part of the story. Some of us, we don't see this necessarily. But what happens is this. David takes in a widow now. And the whole nation thinks David is awesome because he's so compassionate that he took the widow in, one of his own men who died on the battlefield. And so David takes Bathsheba in, and we know this. You know, some of you know this story, that the, the baby is born, the baby gets sick, the baby dies. David goes through ups and downs of this too. And in the midst of all of this, David thinks he had gotten away with it until God sends him the prophet Nathan. And when God sends the prophet Nathan and confronts David, it's in that moment that David, the king, the greatest king of Israel, is confronted with his need for God's grace. In that moment, he's confronted with his brokenness, the depth of his brokenness as a human being. And Nathan comes and says, God has seen it all, David. You are guilty. Your sin is deep. And in that moment, you get a great psalm in Psalm 51. Just like Psalm 30, where God does this, his anger lasts only for a moment, but King David will say this, but his favor lasts a lifetime. This is what David says. David says, oh, weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And you return my wailing and the dancing, you remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy. But Psalm 51, I want to read a couple verses. 
I mentioned this last week too, but I want you to hear this again from David. This is the psalm, this is the prayer of David after Nathan confronts him in his sin. And here's what he says. A few verses from Psalm 51. Verse 5, again verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Can I tell you, there is no greater joy than the joy of God's salvation. There is no greater joy. And in this moment, David, in the depth of his brokenness, cries out to God. And here's the good news. God doesn't leave David stuck in his sin. God doesn't look at David and say, hey, you've accumulated a whole lot of debt. Your sin is so great, I can't help you. Figure it out on your own, David. That is not what God says. Here's what David's prayer is. Oh, God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Turn my wailing into dancing. Restore me, Lord. Create in me a clean heart. And David, until he was met and confronted with the need of God's grace, until he recognized it, he didn't fully embrace the salvation and fully know God's salvation in that moment. Uh, let me tell you another story. Here's another story that you're probably familiar with. It goes like this. A young man, young man, he was ready to, um, he was ready to leave home. He wanted to leave home so desperately he just told his dad, Dad, give me my inheritance right now. And when he said that to his dad in that moment, what he was saying to his dad was, Dad, I wish you were dead right now because usually a young man doesn't get his inheritance until his dad dies. And so he tells his dad, Dad, I want it right now. Give me my inheritance. And his dad says, fine, take it. And this young man leaves home and he goes off and he has an awesome time living it up, paying for prostitutes, living a life of sensual pleasure, gambling, enjoying life that he thought he really wanted, the life he thought he wanted. Except something happens, the money finally runs out. And so this young man finds himself feeding some pigs, and at a little pig trough, he's actually even eating some of the pig food too. And in that moment, this is how the story, this is how the story goes. It says this. And then this young man began to be in need. And then the young man began to be in need. It was at that moment that the story turns, and this is what the son decides. I need someone's grace and forgiveness because my debt is too big. I need it. I need someone to do something in my life because my debt is too big. And he thinks in that moment, this young man thinks in the moment, maybe, just maybe, I'll go back home and I'll ask my dad, Dad, please forgive me, I've sinned against you. Hire me on as one of your servants. And so he turns from where he is and begins to walk home. And you better believe he's rehearsing the speech to his dad. The dad that he just said, I wish you were dead, dad. So he begins to make that journey home. And he gets onto the property and the father is standing there on the property and he sees the son. And you start to imagine what is this conversation going to be like. And his father comes out. And the son begins to apologize and say, Father, please forgive me. And here's what the dad says. The dad says, you are scum to me. You are as good as dead to me. You don't even deserve to be on my property right now. So get off right now and figure it out on your own. You know the story. That's not how it goes. That's how it should have gone. But this is not how it goes. And so when the son starts to walk home, his father stands out in the front, and when he sees his son from the distance, his father begins to run towards him. And in that moment, the son starts to apologize. Dad, please forgive me. Just hire me on as a servant. And his dad kisses him and embraces him and throws his robe on him and takes his ring off and puts his ring on his finger and says, Yo, son, you've come home. My son who 
who is dead is alive. My son who has been lost, oh, he is found. And the story goes, they go in and they begin to celebrate. And they kill the fat and calf in a great celebration. And the father says this, we couldn't help but celebrate. Because joy is the response when someone who is dead comes back to life. Because joy is the response when you've been confronted with the need of the grace of God and finally you recognized your need and you turned to God, repented, you turned to Him and what you found was not a God who was angry at you and ready to kick you to the curb. What you and I found and what you and I will find if you haven't found that yet is a loving Father who is running out to pick you up and throw a big old party for you. Because there is no greater joy than the joy of God's salvation. And let me just say in this side too, there is no greater joy, even for Martha, than the joy of God's salvation, even when life is painful and circumstances are tough. Because I know Martha is a woman of God, and she is about to enjoy the greatest celebration of her life. It already began a long time ago when she came to know Christ. And it's no different for you or me. But it's when the son recognizes his need. It is when King David recognizes his need. That then and there only do we experience the incredible, incredible extravagance of God's grace. Let me tell you, there is no greater joy than the joy of God's salvation. And there are a lot of joyous things in life. And I can tell you this, several highlights, you all know this. There are joyous occasions you can point to. The wedding day, awesome. It was a joyful time. I even tried to dance, and it just was awful, you know. But I, we, we did a little Nazarene-type dancing. It was a joyous occasion. And I looked at my wife on that day, and I thought, I'm pledging you my life in sickness and health, and better for better for worse. It doesn't matter what part of the journey, whatever it brings to us. I'm pledging you complete faithfulness and fidelity. And she looked at me and made that same vow to me. And we made that commitment before God, and we made that commitment before a whole bunch of witnesses. And my wife even gave thumbs up, I think, while we were kissing, right? Yes. She gave thumbs up while the, you know, the crowd and thinking, I didn't know about that until later. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. It, it was a joyous, it was a joyous occasion. And there was laughter, and there was dancing, and we celebrated, and it was incredible. And let me tell you another joyous occasion. When the birth of my son, Wesley, and we're in the, and we're in the delivery room. It's just kind of a surreal experience for those of you who know what I'm talking about. Dads, you know what I'm talking about, but moms, you know what I'm talking about too. It's an incredible, joyful experience. And I know not everybody's story is great. Sometimes it's a painful experience too. But the joy of the birth of a new child. And we, we see Facebook, I see Facebook, but we all celebrate. It's like, where's the, like, the joyful emoji or whatever that we can... You know, praying for excited for you, yes, fist pound, whatever, awesome, go mom and dad. But Wesley, he is born, and it was crazy. The minute Wesley was more than just movement in her stomach, the moment that I saw Wesley in flesh, and all slimy and stuff, <laughs> and I saw him, and I thought, oh my goodness, we created that. We, by the grace of God, we just created a human being. And I was overwhelmed. I mean, we were both overwhelmed. I mean, it was like tears of joy, excitement, like, can, there's no, the baby's not going back in. It's here. Uh, we're taking this baby home, and this baby is with us. No greater joy than the birth of a child. The same experience again with the birth of Kate. And then had a, had a girl, and I, I joke, I've said this to you before, you know, I never had a desire to have a gun until I had a daughter, right? Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and it's one of those joyful occasions so many joyful occasions that we can look at, and I can still tell you this, there is no greater joy than the joy of God's salvation. There isn't. And until you know it, you don't know that. But when you know the joy of God's salvation, it completely, radically transforms and changes your life. And King David and this prodigal son, it's when they experience the need for the grace of God, that it's then when they turn and it's head. I need you, God. And what they experienced was the incredible joy of knowing God's salvation. And all of the joyful things that we can experience, that's it. It's that moment. 
and I've been thinking about this. Here's, here's the thought that I had. I think what can happen in our lives, perhaps with David, maybe, but, but when there's a lack of repentance in our life, there's a lack of rejoicing. You hear me? When there's a lack of repentance, when there's a lack of turning, there's a lack of rejoicing. When there is a lack of need awareness, there is a lack of joy. And what I mean by that is to say, yes, it's David who knows this, is the prodigal son who knows this, and I'm confident many of us know this too. Until I'm fully aware of my need for the grace of God, I will not know the joy of his salvation until I recognize that need. And what can happen in churches, and it has happened for years, is that a lot of people can show up to church and have a form of godliness and have no power. What can happen in many churches, and this happened for centuries, and many preachers have preached this sermon, is what Paul preached. People have a form of godliness, but there's zero power in it. Because some people have not actually recognized their need for God's grace yet. And so they don't actually know his salvation. But man, they know how to play church well. Come on, Pastor, it's joy. Today's joy. We just lit a candle to paint one. I'm happy. And let me tell you, there is no greater joy and this is the beautiful gift that Jesus Christ shows up again on a third Sunday of Advent and says, do you know me yet? Do you know my salvation? Do you know it? Is it possible to show up to church for years and still not know the joy of God's salvation? It is. And my question this morning is, do you know it yet? Because if you do, you just can't help but dance and sing and praise God and even as Nazarene as you get, the joy of the Lord just exudes from you because you have been encountered by the very grace of God the loving Father whose arms are wide open, who never says, I'm going to kick you to the curb because that's what you deserve. He is the God who says, my arms are wide open to you. And my grace is enough. And I want to go kill a fattened calf, the biggest one out there. And if you like bacon, it's going to be the biggest pig. <laughs> and whatever meat you like, or if you're a vegetarian, the biggest piece of lettuce you can find. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what it is, but the Lord is going to throw a stinking party because... There is more rejoicing in heaven that happens over one sinner who turns to God than over 99 righteous people. There's more rejoicing that happens when one person just makes the turn, who recognizes the need for God's grace, and they have smack, the grace of God smacks them in the face. And it's the best smack you're ever going to receive. And you're going to dance, and you're going to sing, and all of God's people are going to dance and celebrate with you. And all of heaven is going to dance and celebrate with you. And I think too often in churches, too, we haven't seen sinners come to repentance in a long time. Because when there's a lack of repentance, there's a lack of rejoicing. When there's a lack of recognizing the need of God's grace, there's a lack of joy in my heart. But when I'm fully aware of my need, my constant need of God's grace, and not only recognize my need, this is what happens. I encounter the grace of God over and over again. And it brings me to my knees, perhaps, in humility. Oh, God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. I messed up. Big. I messed up. I'm broken. I deserve death. I deserve to go to the pit. I deserve hell. And what God's grace in the person of Jesus Christ, what he gives to us, is new life. I'm excited. I was so excited about the birth of my children. Well, let me tell you this. I'm going to be more excited when my children are born again. Okay? And some of us, this language is weird because it's like, it reminds me of like billboard signs. Are you born again? And you're like, oh, really? Like, you know, yes! I'm more excited about when my children's eyes and their hearts are open to the reality that God's grace is right there for them. And they're going to be overwhelmed with the good news that Jesus Christ is for them, has died for them, has come to give them new life. And when they come to know that in turn, 
They are born again. They are born of the Spirit. And there will be so much joy, not only in my children, but you better believe we will be dancing and not embarrass our kids, right? We won't do it in front of them. But we will be crying and dancing because our kids know Jesus Christ. Because their form of godliness, they've heard about stories for a long time. They've heard about God, and we read that little Bible to them, and I'm like, they don't know him yet, though. But they're learning about him. But there's going to be a day, I'm confident of it, that God's going to get a hold of Wesley's heart. And he's going to get a hold of Kate's heart. And their eyes are going to be open to the reality that Jesus is more than a story. <laughs> that he's the Almighty God who took on flesh. To show us not only how to live life, but to lay his life down so that we could be made right with God. And that we could have this new life in Christ Jesus in which we are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. But until this turn happens, right there, the recognition of the need, until repentance happens, there is not much joy. We don't even know it yet. But when that happens, and so this morning is, do you know the joy of the Lord's salvation? And if you don't this morning, before we sing, I just think, Paul says it this way too. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can be so overcome with joy that goes deeper than the pain of death. That goes deeper than my grief. That goes deeper than my brokenness. It's the joy that says you were deep down in a pit just like King David and guess what God did? He lifted you out of it and said, I have a new life for you. You do not have to be defined by your sin anymore. You can be defined by my grace. Your identity is not your sin. Your identity is Jesus Christ is at work and alive in you. Welcome to the journey of faith. I don't know where you are. And some of us might say this. If you have been coming to church for a long time, and you say right now in the depth of your heart, you know God's speaking to you right now, and I know what it feels like because it's happened to me too. And it still happens to me sometimes, and the Lord won't leave you alone. And that's a good thing. But what the Lord is doing in your heart is to say, do you know that you need me? Do you know it? Do you recognize it yet? Because until you do, you will not know the joy of my salvation. And I want you to know it. And Jesus says, I've come so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And it is found and centered in the person of Jesus Christ. This is not about any kind of manipulating anything. This is simply, if God's speaking to, this, to you this morning, if you do not know the Lord's, the joy of his salvation, you can. And if he's inviting you to it, here it is. This is Prayer, yes, this is more than a prayer. A prayer initiates a new journey, perhaps, but God is already speaking to you, and he's been speaking to you for a long time. But when you ask this question, well, how would I know if God saved me? Let me tell you, you know it by faith. You know it by faith. What is faith? You know it by the radical trust of saying, I trust that Jesus Christ died for me. And I trust that my sins are forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross was for me and for the whole world. And I trust that that is true and it will always be true. And I am now living my life to the best of my abilities by God's grace. I am now born anew. I am born of the Spirit. And the Spirit lives in me. And I am learning now to walk and step in the Spirit. I'm learning. And I know that God has saved me. And you can know that and you can know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And you can know how to lead your kids to salvation too. And you can celebrate with them. And let me just tell you, joy, joy to the world, the Lord has come. And we're going to sing that in a few moments as a response. But before we sing that, if there is anyone who has not made the turn yet, Jesus Christ is inviting you. He's not going to force your hand. That's not love. Love is the, the voice that says, come to me. Come here. I'm 
ready to embrace you. Will you embrace me back? Do you recognize your need for me? And it's that moment. That moment. And for some of you, maybe, I don't know. It's not about having to have exact dates of when I came to know Christ. But for some of you, today, December 13, 2015, might be a day that goes down in your story where you say, that is when I fully recognize my need, and I fully embrace the good news of God's grace in Christ Jesus. And if that's you, and you sense God speaking to you, simply say, God, I see it. I see you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Fill me. Today I begin a new journey with you and experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for us. And if that's you, if you want to pray, here's, here's how it happened in Nazarene Church. A lot of churches, this is what the altar is called. The altar was called the, the, mourner, the mourner's bench. This is where you came and cried and wept over the brokenness of sin in your life. And perhaps you came and you cried and you mourned because you recognized fully And there you find yourselves in humility experiencing the greatest celebration you're ever going to experience, the joy of God's salvation. 